Hello, welcome to our Rise of Generative AI and Startup panel. I'd like to introduce and thank our host and moderator, Stephanie Palazzolo from Business Insider, and our panelists, Richard Socher, CEO and founder of U.com, Wei Ping Peng, Distinguished Engineer at Airbnb, and William Balance, CEO and founder at Lavender. Stephanie, let's kick it off. Great, yeah, thank you so much, Scott. So I think just kind of starting out, I believe all of us have had, have had that moment where we kind of realized the potential of generative AI. For me, it was going home over the holidays and seeing my 15-year-old brother ask ChatGPT for career advice, which I was, you know, half impressed by, but also half insulted by that he hadn't asked his older sister first. So Richard, a question for you, you know, you've been working on you.com since 2020. You've been, you've been researching AI for even longer, way before a lot of us had even heard of this technology. So, so looking back, is where we're at today, you know, where you would have expected us to be when you started you.com three years ago? Very much so. Um, we actually started in 2020. We weren't sure yet we would get the you.com URL. So uh, our official name is Suzy Inc. for summary search. Uh, and so we knew summarization would get better. And summarization was is one of the hardest uh, tasks in natural language processing. We in you know, the years 2015 to 2018 had some of the best uh, large language models to you know, predict the next word uh, sequences. We uh, invented prompt engineering back in my uh, uh, Salesforce research lab. And, and that was very much the reason we started U.com because we saw natural language processing getting better and better over time. Yet the biggest application of NLP, which is search, had kind of stayed the same. And we felt like that was uh, a moment for disruption. So I've been very excited about natural language processing, AI research, and now seeing it have sort of this crazy moment where everyone knows about it and has seen this inflection point and feels the inflection point has been incredibly exciting. Yeah, well, I, I'm glad that you guys landed the you.com you URL because I think it definitely has a little bit of a better ring, ring to it. Um, and you know, you kind of touched on how we've seen generative AI and AI just uh, come into the public view over the past couple months and really kind of explode, um, not amongst, not, not just amongst, you know, people who are excited about technology, but just everyday people. So as, you know, generative AI has become more mainstream, how have you kind of seen the demand and interest in you.com change over the past months and, and years? Yeah, it's been a massive uh, change for us. We you know, had been around uh, since uh, late 2021, and had grown reasonably well, uh, but since we launched you chat uh, and made uh, chat the default way to interact with information on the web, we've just had uh, the ro rocket ship growth. In fact, so much so we're like, okay, we have to slow down a little bit, deal with cost to serve and, and, and some other things. And now that we've gotten those under control, uh, growing again very well. So yeah, it's been an incredibly uh, fortunate timing. And you know, sometimes we wonder, should we have tried to launch something before ChatGDB came out or not, but really that moment uh, is making a lot of new upstarts uh, have, have a moment because for the first time, uh, users are accepting the fact that there could be a better and a different and a new way to search the internet. Whereas before, when we innovated in search uh, a little bit here and there, and we had you know a first LM inside uh, a search result, if you write uh, mid last year, uh, for a lot of users, it was still too far away from Google. And when things were too different of an experience to Google, they would often say, oh, I want it to be a little more similar. And, and that has changed. And that may, means uh, there's a lot of opportunity now to disrupt the search engine space. Yeah, I mean, I think no matter what you think about ChatGBT, I think there's there's no doubt that it's been a bit of a rising tide for all AI startups out there. And exactly what you're saying, it's really, I think, showed consumers that there could be a different way to search that's not just typing into a little search bar and getting a page full of results, right? There might be a conversational way to do it, lots of different user experiences. And, you know, we talked a little bit about what it's like to serve consumers, but William, I'm curious to hear from you, what are some of the, you know, challenges that you're facing from a business perspective, selling generative AI products to enterprises? Yeah, it's a great question. So, I think right now, and especially since ChatGPT went really mainstream, there's been a lot of noise in the market and a lot of promises being made. And a lot of times the buyer doesn't understand the real capabilities of what's currently available on the market. And they 
think it's like this uh, silver bullet that can do so much. And there are a lot of really great things that are coming from this mo these models, but there are also a lot of uh, limitations, a lot of hallucination, a lot of things that the models can get wrong, especially when they're left completely un untrained or unfocused. So we first implemented generative AI back in 2021. And now that we're seeing all these new entrants into the market, I think on one hand, it's really exciting. Like we're really pro entrepreneur and seeing all these individual makers launch new products and new innovations is really exciting. But also I find a lot of these become like front ends on chat GPT. They're putting a wrapper around this off the shelf technology, which introduces noise. Uh, for us, I think luckily we did launch it so early. We did start to have a following around our technology earlier on. We've analyzed over a hundred million emails and now we can see different nuances of what types of things are working in different situations for our use case of helping sales emails. I think that's what's really interesting is the ability to point the technology at these specific use cases and then build the application layer around it. So as the buyers become become more understanding of the technology, which I think we're starting to see now that we're a couple quarters past the release of ChatGPT. Now that they're able to understand the nuanced differences between these tools, they are starting to understand that um, insert like X company building generative AI for Y use case may not be the full platform that they need. And they are starting to look at these more focused tools like we're building at Lavender that really solve their specific problem using their internal data versus like the overall large language model more generally. So I think it's one of the biggest things that we're seeing, although more pointed to your question, a lot of noise, but I think the buyers are starting to come around and see like what they're actually looking for as they've been evaluating these technologies. Yeah. And I think kind of the point that you mentioned too, about the idea of these startups building wrappers around you know, GPT-3, GPT-4 is super important. And we'll get to that a little bit later in the conversation. But, you know, you, you did mention the emergence of a bunch of new startups that are, you know, excited about this about this new, new tech. But at the same time, we've seen a lot of more later stage startups, established companies also get interested in, you know, integrating generative AI into their products. So for example, you know, Airbnb CEO Brian Chesky said in an interview recently that a year from now, we're going to see a whole new Airbnb with AI at its core. Um, now, wait, 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 Ping, I'm not going to, you know, ask you to spill any of Airbnb secrets, but talking more broadly, I think, how should these later stage startups and established companies think about incorporating generative AI into their offerings and also doing so in a way that it's able to scale as they have more, more customers? Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. Yeah, well, actually, first, yes, um, my, uh, my point of view here represent my personal ones, don't represent Airbnb. So yes, um, regarding that particular quote um, that I actually think it's a very smart decision. So uh, we all know that AI can, you, can be used to solve some of those challenges. But I think what Brian said really showed his deep understanding about the challenges we're facing. He knows that it cannot be solved by AI alone. So rushing into production with this technology would make us fall into the almost like the age old pattern, right? So you have a solution, a solution is looking for a problem. Um, I believe this would be true for most of the companies, whether startup or established company. Um, at the same time, this technology are not cheap. So I think this is part of cost to serve. Um, sometimes people pay attention to it, but a lot of times I think if you look a lot closer, it'll be also showing up as a much bigger number than you saw. Getting them into production and perform as you ex expect them to be. I think William also referred to some of that too. It's not going to uh, take, uh, just, uh, it, it will likely take more time than you think. How do you control the hallucination? How do you also make sure the, um, the behavior coming back, the uh, feedback stuff, you can all record that. So one thing I would definitely recommend for companies to do is that you almost need to do uh, what we call a technology stack readiness check. Um, what it means is that um, it kind of also goes back to what William says. Um, you Usually you need your own data to make sure it behaves the way you want. So larger company, you also have your own knowledge base and a lot of the, the how, do, how does the, the content getting generated by this generative AI needs to align with your company's vision too. 
So having those data, making sure that your technology stack, it's really there, having the ground truth in the system, it's pretty important to, um, to get ready for to adopting those technology. So yeah. And then so and then you also kind of mentioned too, I, I like how you phrased it, you know, the readiness test for your technology stack. Um, kind of a question around that, you know, how is there a framework that you use around you know, when is the point where I'm ready to release this product? Because I think there also is an element too of there maybe are some kinks and things that don't really get worked out until customers start interacting with it. So obviously you want to walk the that line between not releasing it too early and having something that doesn't work correctly or is sometimes dangerous in some cases versus releasing too late and then still running into maybe some problems that you didn't expect that customers found later on after they started using the, the product. Yeah, that's a very good question. And this is actually, I think, it's not only just generative AI, it's almost about any AI machine learning problem. When you bring it to production, um, it, well, it usually first it works really well in the lab, it has to reach a certain point. And usually we define that almost like a life cycle of such products. Benchmarking in the beginning, it's very important. So uh, we talk about there are so many different uh, large language models and some are fine tuned, some are not. There's so many choices out there. To make sure that we have the right one, usually benchmark is a very important step. You, you should have a, a very good uh, opinion about what's good, what's bad for your specific use case. So understand the use case, do some benchmarking to validate to which type of model it's usable for you. And then we proceed with the production sites. And that also usually you have to collect in the feedback. So you know what, how the model is performing for your expected outcome. And without such a measured way, it's almost like you just let a puppy running in the house and don't know where they are. So yeah, there's definitely a lot of that consideration there. Um, yeah, I believe a lot of the technologists to probably have a lot of deep thoughts on that one too. Yeah, definitely. And then, you know, even beyond incorporating generative AI and AI into your products, um, I think a lot of companies are interested in how to use this technology to also just make their own employees more productive. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious, do you use any sort of generative AI tools to help you, whether it's like around, you know, writing code or, or anything else to help you like become more and more efficient or productive? Yeah, well, the answer is definitely yes. <laughs> yeah, I do use ChatGPT and Copilot frequently. And actually, to also plug in for uh, uh, Richard's company, u.com has a U code where you can go to that tab and then you type a natural language way of asking a question. And then there is a lot of very good example coming back. You can also on the same page, you can put in your prompts and then you can try ask the same question different ways. And then you might get a slightly different result back and you can refer to the stack overflow exact posts to figure out whether it's right or wrong. So yeah, it, it's a, it, I, I would definitely say that uh, using this, uh, generative AI, it's almost a, a best usage of this particular technology because mm -hmm. for knowledge worker, like which I refer to myself sometimes, uh, software engineers, we write code all the time, but do we really enjoy remembering all the syntax, remember all the method, which one to use? We don't, but we enjoy the outcome and we know how, need, uh, how things should be done. So kind of like having, we also know exactly how to validate what's right, what's wrong. So such a tool really provide us almost like a assistant on the side and to just help you to go. And I love the name of Copilot. Yes, we're co-piloting that uh, base. Um, another interesting point actually is, uh, I don't know how many of you guys are already starting to kind of hear about the story of uh, using chain of thought prompts way to interact with a large language model. And it's a pretty interesting one that I, of course, I don't think it's uh, always behaving the way you expect it to be, but I think having a, a large language model where it's capable of having that conversation with you and really break down problems to into smaller chunks and I recently ended up having some, uh, something similar like that when I was uh, exploring one specific problem domain. Having the thoughts to be breaking down into chunks and then you deep dive into each individual ones. Not only it's 
uh, able to help you guide, uh, not, uh, not only provide you the exact answer, it also helps you to think in such a pattern. And that's the one area that I find really useful as well. Gotcha. And for, for these kind of, you know, co-pilot code writing um, tools, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm honestly curious, is it something where it gets you like 90% of the way there, but you still have to have like, you know, a, a, a background in coding, for example, to get that last 10% or like, how close are we to being able to help somebody like myself with, you know, not necessarily having coding background, be able to create a really basic app for, for instance? Ah, yeah, that's a definitely it depends on the level of complexity of the things to do. Like, for example, if you just wanted to create a web page, I think actually nowadays you can literally describe how your web page should look like. It generated a whole HTML code for you and you can validate. But I think some other one can go a little deeper. So, um, for example, I mentioned about they, the model can be hallucinating and they may not really give you 100% accurate answer. So sometimes you do need to validate and without knowing what's right, what's wrong, you could go be let down to a wrong path. So that can happen. Um, using Copilot, I think uh, my experience so far, it's probably harder to, to say the exact concrete uh, percentage, but I think like majority of the, like 30, 40% of the time, it's definitely, I'm, I'm, I can easily say I'm 30% faster because okay. wow. all the things that can be auto-generated, I can quickly glance through it, even auto-generate comments. And so when I talk with another person to say, hey, this is the code that I'm expecting to be, it articulates really quickly about what my thoughts are and how the, how the uh, whole overall code is structured. So yeah, it's a pretty good tool. <laughs> okay, great, awesome. Yeah, I mean, good, good to hear that maybe we're getting closer to a future where I don't know, I could someday <laughs> automate or build an app to, to make myself more, product, more productive too as a journalist. Um, and then kind of going back to a point that I believe William mentioned earlier, you know, a, a big question for a lot of up and coming generative AI startups is around, you know, what model should they build? What, what, what model should they build on top of? So some are using, you know, a third party model provider like OpenAI, others are using open source models or even building their own. So I know, for instance, in this group, Lavender in its bootstrap days use OpenAI's GPT-3, although I know we've talked about how it uses a different combination of models now. And then Richard, we've also talked about how you.com has its own secret sauce of, of models that it, that it uses. And so curious to hear from both of you, you know, why did you choose either approach and how should startups think about that decision of, of their, their model strategy? Yeah, well, I'll go first. I think in two ways, um, for, as a founder, I think the ability to build AI using these off-the-shelf models is great as the entrepreneur. I think as we build a more sophisticated technology company, there will be more internal proprietary things that we're building from like a path to market standpoint. If you're an early stage founder trying to build in this space, it's never been easier to build AI. There's like this democratization happening of AI that allows anyone to start building technology on top of it. And I think with Lavender in particular, we're able to progress so rapidly because we were really early on in incorporating these. ChatGPT began getting big a little bit over six months ago, but we incorporated OpenAI's GPT-3 back in 2021. And in our space of sales emails, that was quite novel. There was no one else really doing that. So when we released that, people thought that was insane. Like it was really an important evolution in the sales email experience. And we were never having the sales person be replaced by AI, but being able to help them write their emails over 50% faster while also increasing reply rates using this technology was really important and meaningful within our space. At the time we were bootstrapped, we did not have the backing of Norwest, Scott and team, and we just had two engineers. So while we're building an entire platform and application and also implementing generative AI, it would have been impossible for us to do that within our, our resources. So we were fortunate that OpenAI did release the API for us to use for, for, for GPT-3. But 
I think the key here for founders is that it helps them build faster and also cheaper, which as we've seen with entrepreneurship over the years, allows innovation to spread a lot quicker. So I do think to my earlier point, there's a lot of noise being introduced by the ease of building these technologies, but it's also good that people are able to build different innovations for different markets on the, the back ends of these technologies. It means they don't have to really reinvent the wheel. And in our case, building for salespeople to help them write better emails, instead of spending our limited resources, time and manpower on building text generation models, we instead focused our attention on building text classification models for sales emails specifically, and sales coaching models for our specific use case on top of our customers' unique data. So we built all of our internal technologies around understanding what makes a good or bad sales email for that individual user. And we've outsourced the text generation to fix those problems to models like a GPT-3 or GPT-4. Um, moving forward, again, we will be building more internal AI models. Keep in mind, when we first started, we had very limited data. We only had a handful of users. We hadn't analyzed that many emails. Now we're talking about tens or hundreds of millions of emails. But back then we were talking about tens or hundreds of emails in the very early days. So now that we have way more data to analyze, we can, moving forward, build more internal models off of that data. But for startups and founders that are just getting started, maybe they're bootstrapping, maybe a little bit of angel funding, just a couple of co-founders, the new generative, new generative AI models allow them to get started immediately with very limited resources. And I think, I think that's great. Yeah, yeah. William brings up uh, the, the good points. Uh, I think generally pre-training of neural nets, both in computer vision uh, and natural language possibly now, enables startups to quickly get an 80% solution and then collect training data uh, and then get this flywheel going of using that training data to fine tune and improve their models. In the beginning, for instance, when we were the first ever to launch an LLM in a search context, we saw especially on people queries, a lot of mistakes. Basically, if you uh, were Michael uh, Schumer or something, then you were both an F1 race champion uh, and a uh, um, congressman and a Nobel Prize winner and a Harvard professor because it basically just took four different CVs from our search backend and mashed them all into one. And that, you know, was obviously wrong. <clears throat> and then, you know, some people immediately said, oh, this technology will never work for search. It just took a while to tune it uh, and improve it for those use cases and then have the model realize, oh, these are different people, only describe one of them and say there are others and, and so on. And so now those work a lot more accurately. I think over time we will see LMs uh, and, and maybe generally pre-trained uh, neural nets to be more and more like databases where you can just download your off-the-shelf MySQL open source database and go and, and build something. Or at some point, uh, if you have massive requirements for parallelism and scale and spikiness and, and other issues, maybe you would still use an Oracle or some, some massive company. I guess in, in this case, uh, the Oracle would be OpenAI. Uh, and, and I think that is starting to feel more and more like where the future is at. And then fewer people will ask like, which database are you using? It doesn't really matter which database you're using. It's what you're putting into it, how you're using it, how you're going to market uh, and so on, which <laughs> maybe also I can answer uh, Vishas question here uh, from the Q and A uh, who points out to one of our competitors uh, trying to get acquired. Uh, yeah, we, you know, I think looking at all the smaller competitors in the search engine space, I think we've outgrown all of them and, and have just more traffic uh, than any of them. But uh, it is indeed our main focus right now. We actually aren't doing much marketing um, anymore in terms of sort of ad spend and things like that. But we are um, focusing uh, almost exclusively on monetization right now. And there are a couple of different avenues. Uh, we're going to have private ads similar to DuckDuckGo. Uh, we'll also have some pro plans uh, for, for power users to get some really neat extra features. Uh, and then we're considering offering some of the APIs uh, that uh, power our internal 
systems uh, like large language models and you know search integrations and and web indices and things like that uh, to offer those to outside uh, outside developers. We have a lot of developers on the platform. They're asking us as users to also want to use uh, some of the underlying technology. So we're exploring and working on these three. Yeah, I think I think the theme that this theme has kind of popped up a lot in conversations that, that that I've had too around a future where maybe your model isn't the main differentiator, but it's actually kind of as as to what Richard just said, but it's everything else that's traditionally been differentiators for startups, whether it's um, your distribution, your go to market strategy, your product um, your product experience. Um, I'm not sure, Wei, 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 Wei Ping, if you have any thoughts here as well from a technical perspective. Uh, sure. Yeah, happy to share some uh, thoughts around that. And it, it is definitely an exciting time. And, um, the answer from uh, uh, Richard and William, I think it's also very insightful how they think about from their company's perspective. Um, if you're a technologist, I think most of the people of us, probably even you don't have to be in this field. Every day in the morning you wake up, you literally see, oh, such a company X has announced a large language model B. So it, it's pretty fun. And at the same time, you also know that there is so much thinking around this. Um, there's the three, the main thing that I think a lot of people are very interested in and paid attention to is the foundation model. I think Richard, you refer to that as almost like a dictionary, almost like a database you can use. It's definitely true. Like it's, uh, they have all the information embedded, encoded in the model and how you do with it, how you use it, you can further, uh, further instruct, further fine tune to the purpose you want. So like for Airbnb, we have so much different area of a problem we try to solve. And like literally this is the time where we go really try to follow through all the developments at the same time. We also really go through the set of benchmark exercise and really understand what type of data we need and what type of ins and outs that we need from the model. Some model actually are specialized in instruction. So we take a look on the uh, database, uh, the data set they used and see where they fit the most. Um, yeah, it's a, I don't think the conclusion is there yet because the development and every day it's changing. So we're keeping a keen eye on that. And uh, the fun part is test benchmarking and then design the system end to end. Gotcha. And you know, another kind of big topic in the, in the news these days um, has been the concerns around the safety of AI technology, everything from misinformation to its use in, you know, high impact fields like health, uh, health, healthcare. So, you know, William and Richard, I'm curious about from the from the founder perspective, how do you guys think about product and company building in an ethical and safe way? Go ahead. Uh, all right. Um... So for us, uh, it, it's a lot about trust, facts, and kindness, sort of our internal values that that guide us. And uh, it's a never-ending uh, never kind of uh, goal because, you know, you can't actually say, oh, trust us. That's actually the worst. If you say trust us, people immediately trust you less. <laughs> we found that out very quickly. Um, but uh, I think especially when it comes to AI technology, there are potentially a lot of pitfalls but there are also some, in some cases, people I think are a little bit overly worried uh, about AI. So one, one concrete case, for instance, is uh, should a large language model be able to talk about uh, a short story about murder or something like that, right? <clears throat> it's illegal. And people say, oh, that's unethical for the LM to produce uh, such content. At the same time, as a culture in America, people love Game of Thrones. Right. And it was a huge cultural moment. Uh, most of my friends enjoyed it. And in it, you had all kinds of horrible things. I don't even want to repeat now. Right. It, it just sounds horrible to say them. Yet it was hugely entertainment, including child murder of like the evil child king and things like that. Right. Uh, and somehow if you were uh, a short story writer or Stephen King or something. Right. And you wanted to use this AI. The AI would come back to you and be like, you're being unethical. And I don't think people would think Stephen King and the Game of Thrones developers were unethical to produce uh, such stories. So I, I think sometimes we, we measure AI almost with a different yardstick uh, in, in many different areas. 
and it has to be sort of the best uh, and the most vanilla version of it. So we're almost wondering if we should actually uh, let the model a little bit looser. Uh, of course, it is it is very tricky, right? And you could then create things that sound pretty terrible, actually. Um, but yeah, I think sometimes people worry almost a little too much on some dimensions and, and not enough on, on other concrete dimensions of you know impact on jobs. Uh, also, you know, misinformation is a really interesting one. You know, the LMs in general can can write a lot of stuff, right? So so can a lot of people. Uh, it's a matter of how you distribute that knowledge. Uh, and and that the, that information and how you teach people to trust it's almost it almost feels like we need to have another campaign where you tell your grandparents and parents to not trust everything they read on the internet all right and and check their sources and so on uh, and and yeah I think there there's going to be another re-education uh, needed just like people now by default don't necessarily trust photos anymore because there's been Photoshop for a long time. We're going to have another moment like that with videos where you have to actually trust the source uh, more before you can trust a video content because uh, video is going to be as good as, as images, I think, in the next couple of years. It is a lot harder, uh, but for short videos and especially just sort of people uh, in a fixed context, uh, not moving ahead too much and so on, we don't know we can already fake uh, very good uh, videos of, of people um, that makes most viewers not realize that this is not the actual person saying these things. So I think it'll be an, an interesting time and humanity will have to co-adapt to, to some of these new technologies as people out there uh, are there to exploit them. Yeah, I mean, I think a quick follow-up on that. I know that you just mentioned you know, some areas that are paid, maybe not paid enough, um, enough attention to. So you, it sounds like you're talking about misinformation. And then you also mentioned what's going to happen with, with jobs. Are those the kind of main areas that you feel like don't get enough coverage or are there, are there any others that you think people should be, should be paying more attention to? I mean, I think, I think the high level to me is that we need regulation, not for AI in the abstract, not for models that are being researched, but for applications of those models, right? As much as I think it makes no sense to say a model shouldn't be this large or you know this fast, uh, it's similar to say, oh, sometimes people do bad stuff with computers. How about we just make the network slower? Everyone has to have a slower internet connection because then you could have you know less misinformation spread as quickly. Or maybe we make all the computers slower so that the models are not as smart, right? And it's just it makes no sense if you think about. AI being in self-driving cars, no one would ever say, oh, let's make the AI not as smart. So just to avoid in the future, maybe the car deciding, I want to just go on vacation and drive away by myself with no passengers. Like, it's just that that's sort of sometimes the level of absurdity that it feels like uh, the conversation is at. Um, at the same time, do I want any random startup to just let their car drive by itself on the highway with no checks and balances and controls? No. Do I want some AI neurosurgeon to just like, do neurosurgery on my brain um, without huge amounts of verification FDA approval? No, that's why we have the FDA. Uh, and I think there are more and more of these. And maybe what people are looking for is what, what is the regulation when it comes to speech, right? And, and different countries have very different viewpoints on this. In the US, you can say anything, you can lie, uh, and it's not illegal. Uh, other countries have restrictions on that. And I think the US is learning that as speech is getting more and more easy to distribute and automate and create, uh, it's pushing on that very definition of, of free speech. Uh, and, and different countries and societies and cultures will, will have different answers uh, to what it means to distribute that and then maybe also to generate it. Uh, and what are regulatory bodies for that? But I think, again, trying to say, let's regulate all of AI in the abstract on research models is, is uh, ill-advised. Gotcha. And then William, yeah, also curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I think Richard brings up a lot of great points. Um, and this, the free speech one is definitely one that's going to become a hotly contested topic in years to come, whether or not the AI itself has free speech, or if I turn on an AI to generate tweets or whatever, is that an extension of my free speech? I think these are all topics that will be debated and regulated in the, in the years to come. But more generally, I think there's a lot of concerns around things like AI created misinformation, impersonation of other people, 
deep fakes, as he mentioned, and accuracy related to hallucinations. A really simple example, I quickly used ChatGPT not too long ago to do a quick math across like five uh, deals we had closed. And the the AI was inaccurate by over $50,000. So if you're relying on the AI to assist you in your job and you're not trusting but verifying that, it could become really meaningful in how inaccurate it could be. And that's just one example. But I think like a lot of markets, there's going to be two sides to it. And right now we're seeing even OpenAI has released an API to detect uh, AI generated text. And Sam Altman just spoke about how there's now they're now detecting AI written tweets. So I think there will be players that come in to detect the AI and then uh, reduce the amount of AI misinformation, et cetera. There's been a lot of talk recently about verification badges and how it was like, quote, a money grab. But I think it's probably more just you need to know is the person that's creating content a human or not? And that's why Meta and Instagram and Twitter are actually un, un, unveiling these uh, verification bad, badges for, for, for more people. Um, now, when it comes to company building and product building, this is something we thought about in the really early stages. Like, are we building, because again, Lavender is building software to help people write better emails faster in their job. And we're servicing people all over the world. And what better means in different contexts might be a lot different depending on who you are. So we needed to ensure that all the text that we were classifying within Lavender was done in a neutral and unbiased and fair way. So when we first started, we intentionally had a very diverse group, both of engineers on our team, but also people around the world helping train our models. And we also enlisted very early on a DEI consultant to make sure we were building models that were ethical, fair, and they weren't going to discriminate when people were being analyzed in their writing. And I think Doing that really early on, while it added a few extra steps to building our earliest product, has now helped us really in the later stages or the you know proportionate later stages as our product has started to spread outside of the U.S. and now are being touched by people in all sorts of languages uh, around the world. Um, in our space of sales emails in particular, one of the biggest ethical concerns that I have is how people are using it for what will essentially amount to spam. So if you've received uh, sales emails before, you're probably used to receiving automated emails that are completely unpersonalized and feel like spam. And that's because generally they are. Salespeople send thousands of emails at the push of a button. They've been doing that for years. And Lavender helps our users write personalized emails a lot faster without slowing them down, but that are still tailored to the user. And I think that's a great way to apply the technology. It's to help people write these personalized, well-informed, relevant emails at a one-to-one -one level, but do it efficiently. Where I'm seeing a lot of people that are entering the market, whether it's later stage companies trying to build in generative AI into their existing platforms or new entrants into the market, they're approaching it from a different angle. How do I have the AI from start to finish completely write the email and then have an automation service automatically send the email to the buyer? And I think that equates to spam. It's just AI from the very beginning to the very end, and there's no human there to assist them. I, I think that eventually once that becomes more pervasive, that the, the major mail platforms like Gmail will have to have an interest in classifying that those emails as spam or at least putting them into the promotions or other tab where our users are trying to land in that primary inbox. But in our specific case, I think that is a, a quickly emerging, uh, I, I, not even a gray area, but just really it's, it's quickly emerging where a lot of players are building technology to use AI to more efficiently send spam. And I think that's, that's concerning and just bad for, for all mailboxes and all recipients. Yeah, yeah. So it sounds like verification and classification and making sure that AI is making us more productive, but not in a way that we're overusing it and, you know, spamming people, for for instance, um, is, is very important here. And then kind of similarly, um, talking about a larger tech company. So Brian Chesky from Airbnb recently said how, you know, he wants Airbnb to use AI to better understand its customers and really customize that user experience. And so um, Wei, Wei Ping, I'm curious, how does a company think about providing that personalization without crossing the line into, you know, exploiting customer information? 
Yeah, I think the this one, maybe I'll use a small analogy here first. Um, so, you know, we all put personal information in places, but we all put there in places we trust. So we put our information in bank, in hospital, and that's actually because we trust them. In return, we get very personalized the services. And this, this is the part that I think is more, more of a calling to say that in order to provide the personalized experience, the first thing I think we should think about is actually building trust. Um, so I think it's good that you see a lot of O'Brien's quotes. Um, I would like to share another two, which I really liked. Uh, the first one is he says, our core business is to build connection and belonging. So Airbnb is a two-side marketplace and building that connection and belonging, that's the one core business. Another quote he said is that uh, we need to go, we need to get our customers permission to build new features. And this is the kind of quote I think that I think it really gives, defines the principle to anchor our approach when it comes to build what we call responsible and trustworthy AI. So there's a lot of talk around that. And I think this new wave of generative AI, it's no different than what AI practice has always should be. Um, so for any companies there, I think if we're thinking about embarking the journey or it's already there, I think the one thing probably can call out is to really focus on gain the trust, build the trust with your customer first, whether it's taking an approach of a human centric, like I think where William pointed that out too, often it's a lot of those things is you put human in the middle, in the center to make sure all the outcomes, all the results, it's going to be having that human in the loop to be trust, trust and verified before we send out. So yeah, and also keep in mind is we, we also know trust is something it's really hard to gain, but really easy to break. And I'd prioritize that over any new features. Yeah, definitely, definitely an, an important you know point to keep in mind for all startups. Um, so also curious as well, you know, Richard, you've spoken publicly about this, but you know, you're obviously going up against some of the largest players in tech, like Google and Microsoft, who often have a lot more funding or initial consumer awareness. So for you, how do you think about you know your strategy for combating these challenges, and what are some advantages that you.com and other emerging startups have that maybe these legacy players lack? Yeah, it, it's kind of interesting. A lot of this, this question comes up uh, quite frequently, right? And and I'm not going to lie, it's, it is kind of scary to be between these two big behemoths. Uh, what's interesting is that some of it is just general startup life, right? It's like, how do you, how could Airbnb have competed with the largest hotel chains? They could have, they have like hired 20, 30 people to build out uh, some other features, certainly. Um, how can any startup compete with uh, a major large company uh, when that large company has all the resources? Uh, certainly Google can build a lot of things on the technology side, but it's just an age old like, innovator's dilemma, right? If you make money uh, and you have tons of uh, partnerships and uh, ads, you know, collaborations and so on with one way of doing things, it's very hard to just switch that around very quickly and move swiftly and innovate um, very, very quickly ahead of everyone else. And so this is what we're seeing right now with Google, right? They have uh, a incredible, an incredible machine of making $500 million or so a day with selling uh, privacy invading advertisement uh, in, in search that then follows you around the internet and so on. Um, and it's very hard to switch that to say, oh, instead of having a bunch of SEO microsites uh, that aren't that good, but the worse they are, the more likely you're clicking on five of those ads in the beginning. Uh, it's just very, very hard for them to switch everything around and say, all right, we're now chat first. Here's this massive new chatbot. They'd lose like $300 million uh, every day when they ship that. And so they need to very, very carefully do it in some separate thing that hopefully only cannibalizes what OpenAI, uh, ChatGPT, and, and we do um, without uh, cannibalizing the main search traffic. And so that's sort of been our North Star. We're a chat first search engine that brings AI features first to market, right? And we're the first to have a Reddit app 
uh, that's been copied since. We're the first to have a TikTok app uh, inside a search engine. Uh, we're the first to have an LM within a search engine. We're first to have uh, citations with an LM inside the search engine. And we're not going to stop. We're, we're going to have more firsts. Uh, but I think the difference will be that the next first will be with more monetization in mind. Uh, and so, so that is one high level. Then there's, of course, privacy, right? You have, uh, it's just very hard for, for Google to give you lots of really great privacy because they make so much money uh, invading it. Uh, and you're, you know, those are, those are just a, a few things that you can think about uh, when it comes to our concrete uh, area, but also startups in general. It is usually the speed and innovation and speed to market, time to market. Definitely. I mean, I think the thing is, is that with these larger companies, they have everything to, to lose. And for startups starting from point zero, they have everything to, to gain. Um, and then so maybe one last question for all three of you before we turn it over to kind of some questions from our audience. So two part question. Uh, when we look down the road, you know, five years from now, first, what are you most scared or nervous about? And then on the flip side, what are the things that you're most excited about in terms of the ways that our lives are going to change, um, you know, in ways that we can't even think about now? So maybe starting out with William. Yeah, so I think it goes back to what I said earlier around the democratization of these AI models and the ability for anyone with an idea to start hacking together a solution that can apply AI and then release it relatively inexpensively and quickly to whoever it is that they think should be using that product. So whatever their, their, niche, their niche is. And I think that's really exciting because entrepreneurs are going to apply, apply it in ways that we can only dream of. And that pace of entrepreneurial innovations that really excites me. I think there are some concerns that come with that. And it, it comes up a lot recently around, is AI going to replace jobs? Is it going to take away uh, people's roles? Like, what should I be studying and things like that? And I think back to like the industrial revolution when people went from being an agrarian to industrialized and that did replace jobs, but it also created new, better and more specialized jobs. But I think moving forward over the next several years, there are going to be some growing pains in this, in this transition, but in the end, we'll be harnessing the power of AI to add value in, in brand new ways. Um, in our case, in particular, as Wei Ping mentioned, we think a lot about keeping the human in the loop. So instead of trying to fully automate our users' role or replace them, we think about how do we build AI alongside them in a more symbiotic way that keeps the human in the loop without trying to intentionally replace the human. Naturally, because in, in our space in sales, it's a relationship business and sales, when it's done correctly, it's inherently human. So I think we're in an interesting position there, but there are going to be a lot of parts of that job and in, in many other jobs that are that are quite redundant and, and monotonous that will be replaced by AI. And I think that in particular thing is both exciting. It's also somewhat scary, but in, at the end of the day, I think it's going to create a lot of innovation, again, fueled by the ease or relative ease compared to years prior that entrepreneurs are going to be able to create new technologies on top of this. Uh, should I go for next? I think you want to go next? Go for it. All right. um, boy, there's so many things to be excited about in the future. Uh, I guess I, I am an optimist uh, looking at most statistics of, of the world. When you zoom out far enough, things have been improving massively on many, many different scales, you know, child mortality, average age, and so on. There are obviously uh, different countries and different places where that hasn't been the case, but overall worldwide, uh, things have been improving massively. I think we're going to see uh, a, an improvement for all people who are smart, lazy. Uh, and it's sort of this idea, if you're smart, but also a little bit lazy, then any repetitive job that just is, feels very boring to you, uh, those kinds of jobs will be more and more automated. And I don't think they'll be automated in a way where 100% of a job category will go to AI, but probably 100 people will be replaced with 10 people that use AI. Uh, and that will be in a lot of places. We have some questions here from Jeremy on how as a skincare company, consumer packaged goods company, like how do you use AI? Well, in service automation, you will have most every company see major disruption, right? People will, like service workers will say, well, I've already answered this question 12 or 20 times. 
at this point, the AI should have picked it up and I shouldn't have to respond anymore to that kind of query. It should have been automated. And so anything where you feel like you've done the same thing a couple dozen times will get, should be picked up by your AI co-pilot, uh, whatever, AI co-worker, uh, co-service worker and whatnot. So I think many boring jobs going away is long-term exciting, but short-term stressful for, for people. Just like, you know, 150 years ago, over 90% of people worked in agriculture. If you told them, 90% of you will not work in agriculture anymore. It was shocking, right? And you have these big machines and they're a thousand times stronger than you are. And if you stood in their way, they would crush you. You know, you can see how people would get scared uh, of that future for a while. Now, if you look back and you say, hey, who here wants to work with their hands every day in the field, for, in the sun and the cold and whatnot? No one, no one says, yeah, let's go back to those days. Like it was just not fun. So long-term, very optimistic. Short-term, we'll put pressure on people to continuously do education, learn new skills, learn how to use AI and be one of those 10% that are just 10x more productive. Uh, I'm personally very excited, of course, with U.com to information access will be even easier, but it's not, it's less and less about access to information, which we've had for many years, but it's being able to deal with the influx of it uh, and hence having summarization, having chatbots that you can ask very specific follow-up questions. They summarize everything for you, aggregate it and provide it to you in a way that you want it, you know, describe it to me like I'm five, 15, 25, the PhD, and then getting the information with your background knowledge and, and personalized to you, knowing what you've already learned about and read uh, prior. I think generative AI is going to make things uh, very exciting in the creation of art. Like if you want to see more art in the world, you'd be very excited about generative AI for videos, for images, illustrations, for music. I think that will be the next one. Um, if you mostly want to make money with it, it's going to be harder because you, you know, it will get, it will change. And there will be folks like Grimes who says, oh, just use my voice, whatever. And uh, I'll get 50% royalty and boom, you have a scalable model uh, or you might be upset about it and you try to sue it. And you know, we'll see both, both of these. And I think maybe at a high level, you can think about generative AI being very powerful when it takes you a long time to create an artifact, but it takes you only a few seconds to verify how useful or correct it is. You know, it would take you hours to draw a painting, but you can look at it and say, oh, that's beautiful or not. Uh, and likewise with front end code, for instance, you run the code, you see that it looks the way it should, and then you're done. And so we're going to see more and more uh, creation being uh, cheaper and faster in the future. And then human judgment and fast iteration uh, and creativity become more and more important. And I think that will make our lives more interesting. Yeah, I think they, uh, you both are very well said on that. I wouldn't add too much and I totally agree as technologists, I feel it's exciting time to see the potential where it can bring us to. And at the same time, yes, we're self-regulated human smart beings. I like to add the smart in the middle. We'll figure out a way. It's just going to take a little time. Um, I'll end with just having one quick quote I loved uh, recently here. They say, AI won't replace a human but a human doesn't know about AI at all, will be replaced or become re irrelevant. And I think it's very important. We're smart beings. Having a very good tool out there, we will try to adapt around it and leverage it and then we go higher from there. So yeah, we we'll definitely look forward for the next few years and look forward to a lot of more higher creativity coming out from human beings. Great. Yeah, a lot of things to be exciting, uh, a lot of things to be excited about. Um, and I, I would also invite the panelists, if you see any interesting questions in our Q&A, feel free to, to call them out. But I do think that the first one that we have is pretty interesting. Um, I think even for me as a journalist covering AI, I get a lot of startups pitching me, claiming that they have a data moat, they have a data flywheel, kind of a lot of buzzwords. And so I've also been curious about this, you know, how much is data a sustainable, a defensible moat for, for startups? Um, so anybody feel, feel free to, to jump in. I can give a little bit of an insight and of course, Richard Williams, you guys go for it. Um, AI equals the data plus algorithm. And I think uh, plus computer resource as well. That's definitely a re really good equation to put it there. 
um, data, I think it is still very important, just like a lot of our uh, current generative uh, AI models. They're all generated from all the knowledge we have offered, and every single one of us contributed to that knowledge base. But then what's good, what's bad, it's really distilling about what you are trying to get with. So I think data is important, and it's also what went to the model itself. It's also very important. And I think also kind of around the place where we talk about bring it into production and behave the way you want. That's also a very important part. Just because we have a book, you can give it out as a book for others to read. Everybody will come out with a different uh, impression. So guiding it through having that working as the way you want to be, I think it's yet another very important part. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's right. Data modes are also continuing to be very important. Uh, I think the ability to move quickly continues to be important. I think unsupervised pre-trained models in both computer vision, natural language processing, uh, biology, and so on will help startups quickly get to an 80% solution and then create their own data flywheels. I think that will be, uh, and is incredibly helpful. Um, is it is data always enough? It's unclear. I think sometimes, especially in, in the B2B context, uh, ultimately uh, as AI, uh, the, the playing field gets more and more even because AI as a field has been really incredible. If you think about the open source and open nature that had been around for a very long time. Uh, really, it's only in recent uh, uh, months and years that AI companies may shift back uh, to not sharing and open sourcing a lot of their cool AI research. But until uh, a year or two ago, most AI labs would would describe uh, their, their AI models, uh, even industrial labs. And so that meant there's very little algorithmic advantages anymore. Uh, and then it was about how you use them. And so Long story short, I think we'll have we'll see some back to the basics uh, thinking of how you go to market, what's your distribution strategy, and and all of those, both in B two B and B two C, and and which AI you're using uh, is, is might be less relevant. It's about how you tune it, how well you create a good user experience. I, I agree. I think which AI you're using will start to become less relevant. I think people will probably combine AIs together. They'll take their AI from one platform to the next. But as far as data, I think data does give a, a strong moat to a lot of companies, especially against new entrants in the market. So I mentioned earlier, like in our space, a lot of companies are starting to build generative solutions for, for writing or for email, but it's hard to have a really tailored version of that product, if you're just starting out and you don't have any data, it's a lot easier to build iterative versions of that when you're analyzing, you know, hundreds of millions of emails. So what we're seeing now is these new founders will reach out to us asking the plugin to our email intelligence and use our data to help them build uh, solutions on top of generative AI platforms. And I think that's interesting, but it also indicates that at least to new entrants in the market, our data layer is a moat against them. However, I don't think that's the only thing. And I think about ChatGPT in particular, what made it so successful was not its data. The data had been around for a long time. GPT-3 had been around for a long time. But then ChatGPT released a chat interface that built on top of it that was super simple to use and just solved all the needs you needed really instantly. And that went really viral. But the technology it used had been around for a while. So I, 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 if you take an example of two companies with that same technology and one has the better UX, that's a mode against their competitors. I think OpenAI just proved that with uh, ChatGPT. So I think the data is a great starting point, but there's a lot of other things that can build moats outside of just the data. Gotcha. Well, I think that's all the time that we have for today. So we'll actually be answering the rest of the questions in a follow-up blog. But a big thank you to all of our speakers and panelists here today. and. Thanks, everyone, for joining us here. Thanks so much for your great questions, Thanks. Stephanie. Thank Thanks you for all. And sorry to all the users that we can't answer all your questions. <laughs>